okay, what are fungi? Well, uh, historically, uh, people seem to think that animals were things that moved and plants were things that didn't. So there was two biological kingdoms, all organisms were either a plant or an animal. Uh, since, you know, when was that? That was the 1600s, 1500s earlier, perhaps we had that sort of dichotomy between plants and animals. Um, since then we've learned a lot more about organisms and we realise that there is a lot more out there. Uh, and fungi is actually a whole kingdom of its own, which is the Eumycota. And then there's other things that were traditionally studied as fungi by people who are interested, which are sometimes called fungoid organisms. So the slime moulds, which are actually in the kingdom of protozoa, are there. And the water moulds, and I'm not even going to begin to enunciate um, its little kingdom because I can't. <laughs> and that's things like Phytophthora. Okay, so we're focusing on the macrofungi, the ones you can see. And there's basically three main groups. Two of them are in the true kingdom of fungi, and one of them is the Basidiomycota. For those people who like Latin, mycos is sort of fungus. So anytime you read myco, think fungus. So Basidiomycota, well, these are fungi which have reproductive structures. So the spores, these things, these are microscopic slides. The spores are produced on a little club, and Basidio means club in Latin. So they have spores on clubs, they're the basidiomycota. So again, it's all down to how things reproduce it, to sort of how they're related to each other. And these guys are most of the macrofungal groups we see are basidiomycetes. And I like these guys because they can absorb lignin. They can actually decompose wood. You know, wood's pretty tough stuff. It hangs around in the environment for a very long time. But these guys have got great enzymes and can actually get into that, which actually means there's a whole series of niches that they fit really well. Ascomycota. Well, these guys are also the true kingdom of fungi, but that instead of the spores being produced outside like balloons on a club, these guys are produced inside a sac, which ascus means sac in Latin, and a lot of these are microfungi. It's a massively diverse group, but there are some macros, so your morels, your cup fungi, and a lot of your lichens are also these ones. These guys are also got great enzymes, but they're not quite... They didn't evolve breaking down lignin. These guys are good at cellulose and other uh, long molecules. Okay, these guys aren't in the true kingdom of fungi anymore. These are the slime molds. And most slime molds are actually microscopic, but some of them do get big. And the neat thing about slime molds is that they have different stages. They have a motile stage. So this yellow sort of lobby stuff, when uh, slime molds start to run out of food, so usually you can't see them because they're microscopic and they're wandering around, usually absorbing bacteria, it's their favourite food. When they start to run out of food, it's like, uh-oh, losing, running out of resource, time for sex. So they all start to clump together. And you can actually watch a slime mold move over hours. If you have a little patch, if you start to see this yellow blobby stuff, I suggest you walk past a lot or set up a camera with a time lapse or something because they, they literally move, which is unusual for fungi. Um, and it's the move, motile stage is called the plasmodium and they all creep together and then they hang out and decide, well, we're running out of food, it's time for sex. So they actually produce a spore mass, sexually reproduce, and that means, you know, the spores can then be dispersed and, and life will continue, which is, you know, all life is about continuing and moving on. So like the slime molds, fungi are different, they're not plants. Plants can photosynthesize, they can capture uh, carbon dioxide, use light as energy, create long complex carbon molecules, which we uh, fungi can't. We can't. I'm not a fungus. Okay. Not this week. Uh, so how do they get their food? Well, they're more like animals. They need to get it from somewhere else. Someone else has to trap the carbon. And there's a few options if you're a fungus. You can wait until stuff dies. It's pretty good. <coughs> Free feed. You've got to compete with a few microbes, bacteria, protozoans, perhaps. But it's a pretty good food source, and then you're a recycler. So these are the rotters and the composters and the, the decomposers. Really important job in an ecosystem. But other ones don't like to wait. There's this food hanging around. I'm food. I could get that fleet's foot. That's a fungus that decides, I'm not waiting till you die. I'm going to live on you now. And I'm not <laughs> going to give you anything other than eat your feet. So the parasites basically hang out in other living things 
and they're usually up to no good. Sometimes they kill you, and other times they just hang out in these other organisms, get a free feed, and are occasionally a bit irritating. There's another huge group of fungi, which is the, the, the mutualists, or the symbiosis. So they hang out in other living things and do good. So a bit like our gut bacteria, we think we eat food and digest it, we don't. Our gut bacteria do most of the digesting, and then when the molecules are small enough, we can then absorb them into our system. So symbiosis and mutualism means something is gained from both groups. Um, and I will now go into these all a little bit more. So the, the saccharotes, the decomposers, these are really common. We see them, but they're in the ecosystem. Oh, I thought I to do. Sorry, I will go back. Mycelium. I forgot to tell you about mycelium. Most fungi are not the fruiting bodies. They're not the mushroom. They're in the thing. So they're, they're like spaghetti in something else. So this is a photo of leaf litter, and I've lifted back the leaf litter, and these tiny, tiny little plants here are actually proto-mushrooms. So a bit like the slime mold that come together for sex, mycelium actually tends to come together too when it's about time to reproduce. But most of the time, fungi are just like the spaghettis in other things, and they, unlike us, which is kind of a, a set, discrete thing, they actually go through soil or logs or leaves or other organisms. And they're this kind of thread, series of threads that hang out together, the same genetic individual doing a thing, meeting other genetic individuals if they're the same species, they reproduce. You know, it's a totally different way of living. So um, mycelium is where it's at for most fungi. Uh, yeasts and other ones are slightly different. They have a cellular lifestyle, uh, but most fungi that we're talking about in the macro fungi have this, their threads, they're in the thing, that's how they live, and we see the reproductive structures when they come together and it's time for sex. So I'll just now go back to where I was, got to do that. So the decomposers, the logs, the you know, big old trees that have fallen down for whatever reason and, and you know, are a store of nutrients, can be decomposed by lots of different fungal species. Some of them are decomposing the cellulose, the hemicellulose, the lignin. You know, they're breaking it down, recycling it, absorbing it for themselves, but then also the system's a bit leaky, so then there's nutrients for the plants and other organisms in there. Uh, beetles love eating fungal hyphae. We think beetles eat wood, you know, borers eat wood. Well, actually, they may eat the wood and chew it up, but usually they're actually absorbing the chitin, so the fungal hyphae in that wood is actually easier to digest than the wood itself. They also have protozoans in their, in their bellies that are also being able to get into woody substances. So termites don't actually aren't into the fungi as much. They have protozoans that do the wood digestion for them. So that's why I'm an ecologist. There are all these weird ways of living and ecosystems kind of, yeah, to me it's just this you know, sweet and weird combinations of organisms doing weird things. So, yeah, decomposers, utterly awesome. If you're a gardener, you know that compost gives you nutrition and that's because these systems are a bit leaky and there's a bit more nutrients available. And without them, we, you know, lots, everybody dies eventually and in an ecosystem timescale, dead stuff is actually the, the resource for the next generation or the current generation that it's living on. So without the decomposers, ecosystems become very unhealthy. Parasitic fungi. Again, another weird and wonderful group. Uh, the example I've got here are the cordyceps. So there are grubs that generally live on the roots um, and in the soil profile of, of plants. I think black wattle are one of the preferred grubs for cordyceps gallinae, which is the fungus that then absorbs the grub. So these grubs wander around, eat their stuff, and occasionally they get a, a fungal spore and it attaches to them and actually takes over so when this grub decides it's time to sort of hang out and change from its, its grub stage to its adult beetle stage, instead of doing that, it actually then becomes mummified, taken over by the fungus, and the fungus then tops up its reproductive structure. It's all about sex. If you're not spreading your spores, you're not doing your job right. So parasitic fungi, yeah, it's no good for the grub. It's dead. <laughs> but it's good for the fungus and it's you know, spread the spores. And diseases in natural systems, like I don't think they're all evil, uh, in natural systems, if, it, if everything was you know, 
we were all genetically the same and there was no diseases coming in and weeding out the weak, like natural selection wouldn't happen and there wouldn't be gaps created. You know, natural systems have pests and diseases and they usually attack things that are overgrowing. Too much of one species, nature usually pulls them back and, and diseases is one way to do that. So, you know, don't have a problem with parasites unless I've got them myself. <laughs> so, my favourite group of the fungi and the, and the way they absorb nutrition is the mutualists. I like cooperation. I think collaboration, cooperation, facilitation are all great ways to do things. Uh, and so I love the mutualistic fungi. So these guys live with and often in other organisms and they do good. So uh, I believe in evolution. Somebody asked me in a talk two talks ago, do you believe in evolution or creative design? So now I'm out there, I'm an evolutionist. I believe in evolution. So when life was crawling out of the oceans, this is my theory, um, you know, plants, you know, they probably came out with their fungal partners, probably not as the, you know, that mycorrhizae we now see, but plants, most terrestrial plants do not get beyond the eight leaf stage without at least one fungal partner and often lots. It's not a monogamy, mycorrhizae are not monogamous. You get, often get lots of fungi with one or two plants and often during the life of a plant, it can have different mycorrhizae at different stages. In dry years, there's a better group of mycorrhizae to have than in wet years, in, you know. So there's a lot of partner changing, multiple partners, but it's all good because they're all helping their plants. They get out there, the hyphae are really fine. So this is a teeny tiny tiny seedling, tiny. And the spaghetti that you can see are the plant roots. So gardeners, when you plant stuff, and that seedling that sits there and does nothing for ages, it's putting down its roots and getting started. So you can see how much effort that plant is putting into its roots. And this white fuzz, is the fungal partner. So fungal hyphae are much thinner than, than roots and that's an advantage in the soil environment because it costs less to produce and you've actually got stronger capillary action so you can actually absorb water and other nutrients easier. So fungi wander around, the mycorrhizae and fungi spread their hyphae, that spaghetti, absorb nutrients and various other things to then share with their plant. And in return, that little photosynthetic thing sticking up there captures carbohydrate, sends it down, shares it with its partner. So mycorrhizae, most terrestrial plants need mycorrhizal partners, but we don't see them do it. It was all in the soil. So originally when people started researching fungal roots, any time they saw fungal hyphae in a root, they assumed it was some sort of parasite or pest or disease. This is untrue. And in fact, more recently, we've discovered there's something called endophytes. And these are a bit like mycorrhizae, mycophagus, rise of root. So that mycorrhizae are on the roots of plants. There are actually fungi living in the tissues of other plants that we're just beginning to find out about that aren't doing harm, aren't diseases, and really we don't know what they do. Okay, that's what I've just done, is all the mycorrhizae. So here's... Here's a macrofungus that's microbial, little puffball, and yes, yeah, we need them. Our ecosystems need them, and we don't know. We can't say, oh yeah, Regnan's Forest, you should have 80 mycorrhizae, and these are the species we usually get in Tassie, and these are the species we usually get in Victoria. We don't have that level of knowledge yet. And to me, to know what the trees in an area are, but not know what the plant part the fungal partners are, is just foolish. If, yep. if the other 10% don't have the mycorrhizal relationship, yep. what do they? Uh, prote so proteas, or the, the proteaceous family, they have funny little nodulose roots and they get the nutrition in a different way, which is one of the reasons why um, proteaceae are very sensitive to Phytophthora, because their roots are actually more open and unprotected by fungal partners. But yeah, there are other ways to absorb nutrients. And that's how a lot of um, monocultures... It's not another organism that they're... No. They're doing it themselves. They're doing right, it themselves. You know. uh, some of them might partner, like, uh, cycads do have, uh, seem to have a partnership with cyanobacteria, but it's not the same as mycorrhiza. It seems to... I, I don't understand totally what they're doing, but there are other partnerships. So um, the legumes, so the nitrogen fixing, they have a partnership with rhizobia, which is a bacteria that can trap nitrogen from the atmosphere. So yeah, there are some partnerships with bacteria for nitrogen, but the bulk of um, 
symbiosis with plants and fungi. Well, plants is with the fungi. The fungi is the, the big group, and yeah, they wouldn't have colonised. Well, they might. The current model on this planet is that they colonised using the fungi. The, the fossil evidence for those early plants is that there were microbia at that stage. And uh, hornworts, so the, you've got mosses with lots of hornworts, that little green scum that most people don't notice. Hornworts are mycorrhizal. So that very early, you know, you, hadn't, you haven't developed lignin, wood doesn't exist yet kind of planet, mycorrhizal fungi were already there doing stuff and starting this partnership with this green scum that was hanging around. Okay. Lichens. So this is another symbiosis. Some people say that the fungi are parasitic on the algae of cyanobacteria, and you know, that's, that's, that's one theory, and there's, there's a whole book on it. But I actually, I'm a, I'm a believer in cooperation, so I think lichens are, are a symbiosis and a mutualism that I, I have been argued with. So, lichens, they look a bit like a plant or a little plant, and they're often on things. The bulk of the carbohydrate is actually fungal, and but the, the carbohydrate is captured through photosynthesis, so that's through the, the, the algal partner or the cyanobacteria partner. And sometimes if you see a lichen and it just looks a bit funny, it's like it's got a Jekyll and Hyde look, that's often because it's actually got both algal and cyanobacteria partners at the same time. But, but fun, uh, lichens look a bit different depending on which partner they have. So you can actually get that weird expression, just like different, because they just switch on slightly different genes with the different partners. So yeah, they've, they've hung out together for millions of years, so they're at that, you know, they don't just know your mood, they turn on different genes for you. <laughs> and I said most um, lichens are ascomycetes. So ascomycetes, again, are those ones that have the sacs and often the little discs and the cups. That's a sure sign you've got an ascomycetes, you've got little cups. So lichens, although they're a symbiosis, they actually reproduce separately. So the fungus spreads, sends its spores separately to the cyanobacteria and algae, which are free living. And so there's only, I think, 20 or 30 photosynthetic partners, there's algae and cyanobacteria, that partner with the fungi. But each fungal lichen species is the fungus species, not the, the photosynthetic partner. And, uh, you know, I love lichens, but I'm really at the really beginner stage, so I talk about leafy lichens and shrubby lichens and crustose lichens. Like, I'm at that you know, broad form. I'm still going trees and shrubs and grasses in the lichen world because I haven't learned enough to be on that sort of first name term. You know, so this genus here is Pseudocycleria, I did look that one up. Um, I actually identified it because I took a photo. But yeah, lichens are a whole group, but like most biology, once you get into a group, you realise there's special tricks and it's a bit tricky and takes a while to catch it. So I'm hoping to have, you know, get my head around lichens before I die. <laughs> So that's the, the three ways fungi get their food. But I also just want to, I'm an ecologist, so I'm going to mention that fungi are food. And fungi are good food. And in Australia, fungi are a really important food source for some of our ground dwelling mammals that we, most people know, are probably some of the most threatened vertebrates on the planet. So, why? Why has Australia got these truffle like fungi? Why? Well, Australia ripped away from Antarctica. We went from a really quite wet system to a dry system. We got certain polar currents, the wind blew, Australia dried out. We went from a wet continent to a dry continent. If you're a mushroom, you pop up. You've got the stem, you pop up, your gills pop out, you know, your spores get spread by the wind. That's the sort of dynamic of a lot of macro fungi. Well, you're in this continent that's drying out all the time. You know, why pop up? If you keep popping up, before your spores are actually mature, you've desiccated and you've become a dried fungus. So perhaps you just don't pop up. So what happened was there were these ground dwelling vertebrates, little, little marsupials and the like, and they wandered around and ate you. And that's okay, because you're a bundle of spores, and hanging out in crap's great, because you get loads and you get spread. So this three-way interaction developed in Australia more than any other continent. We have small ground dwelling animals, that are the vectors, these guys move the spores around. They move the spores of these truffle like fungi. And these truffle like fungi are mycorrhizal. So they're partnering with the plants. So if we're talking genetic bottlenecks and long term ecosystem health, we need the vector, the little marsupial running around, the, the plants, 
and the fungal, the diversity of fungal partners. So my concern for conservation at the moment is we have this sort of living history where there were <coughs> sort of 200 years from the, the start of the mass extinction. So healthy ecosystems, animals moved spores, spores moved around with the animals, usually within an ecosystem of two of each other. But there was a choice. If you're a plant seedling, you pop up in your soil, there were different spores in the soil and they gave you a different choice of fungal partners. I'm scared that we actually have the living dead of ecosystems where now if you're a seed, you drop down, the only choice of fungal partners you've got are the fungi that are actually within land <coughs> ecosystems and we've lost this little, little, the organisms that do the spreading. So fungi are a really important food source and they've actually looked at lactation in some of the, the captured populations of these uh, particularly potaroos and the like. And if you don't give them fungi in their diet, their milk is not as good. They're, they're not getting the nutritional source. So particularly people used to use kangaroo formula to feed some of these other smaller marsupials, not so good, not the right nutrition at the right time. So, you know, if you're doing uh, vertebrate conservation, get your food right, give them the fungi they need. And I'm, I'm a bit of a, a foodie, so I think don't just give me the garicus, don't just give me commercial mushrooms all the time. I think the reason these guys probably ran around, and one of the reasons there is massive diversity, is that you get different things from different foods. So the odds are a lot of different fungi are going to be better for your nutrition if you're a vertebrate. So, yeah, fungi are food, and in the Australian ecosystem, it's a really important part of our, our, our healthy ecosystems. So we need all of them. We need the fungus, we need the plants, and we need the little beasties.